First on BBC One, Murder in Belgravia, The Lucan Affair, a documentary that sheds new light on one of Britain's most notorious crime mysteries. The pub was very quiet that night and lying on a bench seat just inside the front door was a lady I now know to be Lady Lucan. She was not being attended by anybody. She was talking, rambling almost, but she had some fairly serious head injuries which I noticed at the time. Veronica Lucan told Sergeant Baker that the man who had attacked her had been her estranged husband, John, the Earl of Lucan. And as she was going out, she said, and he's murdered our nanny. This was the first reference to the nanny that I'd heard from her. Well, I asked her to repeat what she had said. And she said, he's murdered our nanny. Sergeant Baker saw Lady Lucan into an ambulance and then he and another officer made their way along Lower Belgrave Street to number 46. I opened the door and there was light in the house, more from up the stairs than from the level I was on. At the time, we were looking for a person who had assaulted Lady Lucan, most likely her husband. I didn't know what he looked like. I was just looking for any person, any male in that house. The first room I went into was the upstairs living room. I found nothing there. worked our way up through the house and in what was obviously the main bedroom there was a blood-stained towel on the double bed and various traces of blood up the walls as we went. From what we had seen going through the house I suspected that the statement made by Lady Lucan may have been true we may be looking for a body. We continued up to the top of the house where I opened a bedroom door and was greeted by a young lady. I think she was about eight or nine at the time. I don't remember exactly. I had a conversation with her. Francis. Hi, Francis. Is that your little friend there? Yeah, Tim. Hello, Tim. Is there anyone else in the house, Francis? Yes, my little sister and brother. They're next door. Next door. She was very calm. She was certainly in no distress. Can you do me a favour? Go back to bed and you look after Tim, all right? Make sure he looks after you. And I'll send one of my officers up in a bit, okay? Okay. All right? I'll see you in a minute. Going back down the stairs, as well as looking for a suspect, which I think I was pretty sure then that there was nobody in the house, we were also looking for a body. We eventually arrived down in the basement. As the two officers reached the bottom of the staircase leading to the basement, they stumbled at last upon the sort of evidence they'd been looking for a large pool of blood, and beside it a canvas sack, actually a US mail bag. I took out an arm. There was no doubt in my mind that 
the girl in that bag was not alive. The body doubled up in the mail bag was that of the Lucan children's nanny, 29-year-old Sandra Rivet. In time, Lady Lucan recovered from her wounds. But after that night, her husband vanished into thin air and has not been seen since. Though seven months later, a coroner's jury, solely on the evidence of Lady Lucan and without any cross-examination, was permitted to name him as Sandra Rivet's murderer. What exactly happened at 46 Lower Belgrave Street that night? Did Lord Lucan murder the nanny? Is he still alive, now aged 60? And what reasons are there for thinking so? Well, tonight, with the help of detectives and lawyers, family and friends, some speaking for the first time in 20 years, we try and find out. But first, let's look at the background that led to this extraordinary and tragic series of events. Sandra Rivet came from Basingstoke, one of four sisters. A pretty, lively girl, she had recently parted from her husband, Roger, and only six weeks before her death, had made her way to Lower Belgrave Street to take up her post as the Lucan children's nanny. After a custody hearing which had gone against their father, the children were living with their mother as wards of court. Lucan is a well-known name in army circles. It was John's great-great-grandfather who gave the order for one of the greatest, and some say most glorious blunders of British military history, the charge of the Light Brigade. John Lucan's father, Patrick, the sixth Earl, was a Labour whip in the Lords in Attlee's government, and his wife, Kate, was a Labour Party activist. Their elder son, John, born Lord Bingham, was the second of four children. His younger sister, Sally, remembers a happy childhood. He was always great fun to be with because he always had projects. Things were going on. Where John was, something was going on. And this would involve us all. He was very much a, a linchpin amongst the children. And we would follow along and um, do, roughly speaking, whatever he was doing. And um, that was great fun. Eton seemed hardly the ideal school for John's left-wing parents, but that is where they sent him. Here, in contrast to them, he adopted right-wing views, speaking disparagingly of immigrants and supporting capital punishment. He was at this time a handsome but fairly undistinguished upper-class boy. It was also at Eton that he first developed a passion for gambling, thus planting early in his life the seeds of his ultimate destruction. I liked him very much, but there wasn't anything you could say about him that was exceptional, except he had a very good sense of humor, and he had a rather wicked sense of humor, and he, he was given to practical jokes, and he used to hide his guilt behind the slightly sort of uh, demure expression. He had a very good bland face when he wanted to. After national service, Lucan took an active part in the London social round and was a regular escort of debutantes. He instantly made an impact. I think anybody who met him would have felt that because he was very tall and he was very good looking. He was also a good conversationalist and uh, his interests and, uh, and mine very much worked well together. He was very interested in music and we both shared this uh, interest in Bach in particular. He was also a keen winter sports enthusiast and not afraid to try his hand on the famous Cresto run. Powerboat racing was another aspect of his fascination with speed and competitiveness. But a tough time ahead on the 190-mile all-out slog to Torquay. In 1963, as Lord Bingham, he entered his boat, White Migrant, number 48, in the Daily Express powerboat race off Cowes. He held the lead almost until the end. There's a mishap hereabouts. Lord Bingham's white migrant had to make an undignified exit and eventually sank. Fortunately, no harm to the crew. But his abiding passion was gambling. After he had won 26,000 pounds playing Schema de Fer, he decided to pack in his job as merchant banker and to make gambling a full-time career. And from now on, night after night, his distinctive figure was to be seen settling in at the tables. 
when it was realized by the family that he was going to take up gambling professionally as a, as a way of life, the whole family were pretty dismayed. We all knew that it was not a very um, secure way of life. So we were sad that he'd decided to pursue this as a career. I was very wet behind the ears, perhaps. I probably didn't know that there was this huge gambling world that went on. In those days, we were much more innocent than, than people are now. Um, I really just didn't know much about it. While Sally had settled down to life as a country vicar's wife, Lucan's spiritual home had become the Claremont Club in Berkeley Square. Here, John Lucan lunched and dined and with his friends gambled the hours away. They were a very mixed bunch and included the artist Dominic Elwes and the zookeeper and entrepreneur John Aspinall, the club's first owner. Veronica Duncan came from a rather different social background. She and her younger sister Christina grew up in the Wheatsheaf Hotel in Hampshire where their mother's second husband was the tenant. Veronica moved to London and found work as a house model. When Christina followed her a few years later, she soon caught the eye of millionaire Bill Shand Kidd, and in 1963 they were married. Veronica was introduced to a lifestyle different from what she had known, in the course of which she met Bill's friend John Bingham, then about to become Lord Lucan. We knew nothing about Veronica until John announced that he was engaged to her. I think we couldn't understand why he was marrying her, to put it at its plainest. But then you can never see what somebody else sees in a person, otherwise none of us would ever get married, I don't suppose. We sort of hoped we'd meet her, and, and because John was such a friend, that we would all uh, meet up and perhaps have dinner with them in low Belgrade and things, but it, it didn't ever work like that. She never seemed very keen to, to meet any of, of the old team, really. On 28th of November, 1963, just 10 months after Veronica had been bridesmaid to the future Mrs. Shan Kidd, she walked down the same aisle on the arm of the future Lord Lucan. At her wedding, she looked absolutely fantastic because she was minute, and there was this, she must have been about five foot one, and there was John, dark, and she was very fair and very thin, and she looked as if a puff of wind would blow her away or less, and so they looked really very romantic. I think he was very protective of her. Um, because she seemed to need protecting, because she was, as, as we put it then, and I'm sure it's been said before, she's like a bird with a broken wing, and, and he was very um, careful about things that were hurt. And she wasn't physically hurt, but I think she, that's how I saw the relationship. When they were first married, John and Veronica seemed quite happy, but she was quite undemanding as a wife, I would say. She tolerated him living virtually the same life as he did as a bachelor. And to that extent, I think she should be given some credit. Um, she was, though, bear in mind, she was very pleased to be Lady Luke, and it was something that I've really never come up against uh, with anybody else. I mean, she almost preened herself at being the Countess of Luke. And Cut to the bank on three. The bank wins nine six. Veronica didn't gamble at all, and nor did she chat to the other people who were there, sort of walking around, you know, and not gambling or having drinks and that sort of thing. She would sit at the side of the room, sort of like a Victorian wallflower or something, uh, speaking to nobody, looking absolutely miserable, and. She wasn't even looking off over John's shoulder to see how he was doing. She was probably, oh, a long way away, so she couldn't see how he was getting on. But she would just sit there looking miserable and not go home. Two months after his marriage, Lucan's father died, bequeathing him the title and a quarter of a million pounds, which, for a time, would cushion his gambling losses. By 1970, the Lucans had had three children, Francis, George, the new Lord Bingham, and little Camilla. But also by now, Lucan's gambling losses had led to overdrafts in all his accounts. Veronica seemed to have no interests of her own. 
Night after night, she accompanied her husband to the tables. The emptiness of both their lives seemed to affect her mind and behavior. When Veronica made a scene, John would get very embarrassed and he would react in one of two ways. He sometimes was so embarrassed he just didn't say anything and hoped it would just go away, which is fairly normal English behavior and we all are a bit like that. Uh, and occasionally he would bark at her and he got quite fierce. Well, she certainly didn't seem very stable to us. Um, there was a lot of outbursts of one sort or another. Um, either about us and our particular lifestyle or about our children or whatever it might have been. Um, things did not meet with Veronica's approval. Lucan was devoted to his children, yet after the birth of each one, his relationship with Veronica deteriorated further. One reason for this was the disturbed state of her mind, which led Lucan to take her to a number of psychiatrists. He genuinely believed, rightly or wrongly, that she was suffering from paranoia. His domestic situation became increasingly insupportable, and just ten years into his marriage, he moved out of Lower Belgrave Street to a flat just round the corner. I'm sure he would have tried to keep the marriage together because he just loved those children. And I've seen this with other men whose marriages have gone wrong. They, they develop a very, very great sense of protection uh, if they think that their, their wife, that the mother is not up to doing the job. And that I would have said that John put a sort of mantle of security around them. He did not think that she was mentally balanced enough to look after them properly to care for them, so he was frightened for their welfare. And so he obviously was very, not upset just of not having them himself, but very, very worried for what would happen to them being looked after by Veronica, who was mentally unsound. And so began a bitter custody battle for the children. Lucan won the first round when he persuaded a judge to accept that Veronica was unfit as a mother. Children are coming home with me. This is a court order from the judge. I now have custody. Yes, come with us. We've got to pick Francis up from school. Come on, then. He set up home with them in the flat in Elizabeth Street and hired a full-time nanny. Francis was given piano lessons by Caroline Hill, and Lucan helped George with his schooling. But Veronica had not given up. Two months later, there was to be a full-scale hearing for the long-term custody of the children, one in which Lucan was only too aware of the disadvantage, although of his own making, from which his case suffered. Yes, my lad, I am a professional gambler. So Lucan yes. called on his friend, Michael Hicks Beach, a literary agent, to help him formulate his case. He was at pains to draft a reply to this, to show that, in fact, he, as a professional gambler, had a great deal more time for his children than a normal businessman who left for the office at quarter to eight in the morning and didn't get back until 7.45. And he merely asked me to put in some telling phrases, put them into what I thought would be a powerful plea. It was very unusual, of course. This is 20 years ago, and it was uh, always considered right and proper and uh, almost essential that children should be left with their mothers, no matter what the mother might be like. And therefore, to try to go against that was very hard work, but we thought that my brother had a good case. Well, you see, we had medical evidence, this I can say, uh, two well-known doctors on each side, and the judge found very definitely against him. The children were made wards of court, but could live with the Veronica, provided she employed a full-time nanny approved of by the court. He was very bitter when she regained custody of the children. That is the angriest and unhappiest I've ever known him. And he said that it was the money it cost him that made him give up. He had to give up. He couldn't afford to go on. 
I think he was he was very low for a while. Yes, um, inevitably he was um, very sad because this is something he'd set his heart upon and and thought was best for the children, and it wasn't going to happen. He wasn't the person to be down for very long, so it was immediately a question of getting enough material together, evidence together, because he had been made to feel that it would be very worthwhile uh, going back to the courts. Hello, Veronica, it's me. Life at number 46 became the focus of Lucan's attention. As well as tape recording his calls to Veronica, he hired detectives to follow her. His aim was to gather evidence of her instability, so he sometimes provoked her in order to get a response. He was equally obsessional about his children. He noted the rapid turnover rate of nannies at number 46 and began to check on them in the hope of finding further evidence for raising the custody issue. He thought that the nannies going to Lower Belgrave Street were one worse than the next until it came to unfortunate Mrs. Rivet, uh, whom he uh, took out to lunch or dinner and um, thought her quite splendid. And so did the children. Sandra Rivet arrived at the end of September and at long last it looked as though the children had a nanny they liked and who might stay. Less than six weeks later, she was dead. On the night of Thursday, November the 7th, 1974, the family were looking at television in different rooms. Francis, upstairs in the nursery, had switched on Top of the Pops. Later, in the bedroom on the floor below, Lady Lucan watched Mastermind. Put Camilla and George to bed. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Would you like a cup of tea? Yes, that would be nice. After picking up some dirty crockery, Sandra made her way down four flights of stairs to the kitchen in the basement. Gone to make some tea. Sometime after Veronica had stumbled into the plumber's arms that night, Lucan's mother received a disturbing telephone call. Hello? Mum, it's John. There's been a terrible catastrophe at number 46. What are you talking about, John? What's happened? I was passing the house and saw a fight in the basement. Veronica's hurt, and I want you to collect the children as quickly as possible. Ring Bill, and he'll help. I'll call Bill now. And the nanny's hurt. Badly? Yes, I think so. I'll speak to Bill immediately. Bill Shankid was out, so John's mother collected the children from Lower Belgrave Street. She was met by police officers asking if she knew where her son was. She didn't know. Veronica, meanwhile, had been taken to St. George's Hospital, where, despite her head injuries, she was able to tell police how she'd been attacked when she went to look for Sandra. 
CID officers from Gerald Road Police Station went to the hospital to interview their only witness. She told us briefly what had happened, how that she'd been attacked by her husband, Lord Lucan. We expected to find him that morning. To be truthful, what I thought was that he would walk into the police station with his solicitor about nine, half past nine that, that morning. From the night of the murder, Detective Chief Inspector David Gering ran the case under Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson. They soon decided who was their chief suspect. I think the police made up their minds very early in the investigation, indeed on the morning that I went to collect the children after, on the 8th of November, there didn't seem to be any suggestion that they were looking for anybody other than my brother. But had the police delved far enough into Sandra's life? I was satisfied that there were no people in her life with whom um, she was uh, at disagreement with, and certainly not to the extent of somebody wanted to murder her. But Sandra had a warm, open disposition, and in the short time she'd lived at 46, she'd made many friends locally. She had boyfriends, too, of whom the police knew little. So was it not a little premature to rule out any other suspect but Lord Lucan? The general feeling on the squad was that Lord Lucan had committed the murder. I don't think there was any doubt by any member of the squad that that was the case. But of the police's chief suspect, there had been neither sight nor sound. Where had he got to? At a press conference, Roy Ranson said, as police do, they would like to talk to him, as they believed he might have information that would help them in their inquiries. The same morning, the news began to spread among Lucan's friends. Aspinall invited six of them to lunch, and in 1976, at his zoo at Howlett's in Kent, I asked him what they had talked about. We were all concerned with what would happen if he appeared at Howlett's or Port Lim or where he's been several times, he's been in this room many times, and uh, what we would do and how we would react. And what did you decide? Well, everybody, I suppose, decided differently because people behave differently when somebody arrives, when a situation is like that develops. You have to make the decision almost on the moment. In fact, even what you think you're going to do, you don't necessarily do. What I probably would have done would, if he had appeared here is anything that he wished. Yes, you actually say, if he had begged asylum from me, he would have got it. He would have got it. Even though at that time, there were certainly grounds for thinking that uh, he'd murdered the nanny. At any rate, the police were looking for him. He would have got asylum, regardless of the consequences. I mean, Aspinall was pragmatic and sensible, as he always is. He's a very articulate man, and uh, I think he probably took the majority view that Lucky had created this appalling problem, and would probably would and should commit suicide. Um, Dominic, being a, a, an artist and um, and somewhat more fay than the rest of us, thought that a banana boat to Brazil would be the answer. And I certainly said, well, there's really nothing that us gas bagging away are going to do for him, except we all agree that we want to help him to the limit that we can. Three days after the murder came a possible clue to Lucan's whereabouts. In a street in New Haven on the Sussex coast, an alert police officer found a car which Lucan had borrowed from a friend and had been driving around in for the last couple of weeks. I stopped, had a quick look at the car, saw that it was uh, considerably bloodstained inside, the seat, the upholstery, etc. And uh, that confirmed that this was probably the vehicle that we were looking for. New Haven is the ferry port for Dieppe, and it naturally occurred to the police that Lucan might have gone over there. Two days later, Roy Ranson told the press that a warrant had been issued for Lucan's arrest. What are the implications now of having received these warrants from the magistrates? Well, I'm now in a position to have him arrested abroad. I wasn't prior to doing this. Would this have any effect on anybody who is harboring him in this country? It would, yes. In what way? Well, if they harbour or aid or abet him, they can be arrested. If Lucan couldn't be caught alive, perhaps he might be found dead. Frogmen were called in to dredge the waters in the harbour, 
Police searched the cliff tops and derelict buildings along the coast. During the next seven months, there were unconfirmed sightings of Lucan in all sorts of unlikely places across the world. People could not bring themselves to believe that so distinctive looking a man could simply vanish. By the summer of 1975, the Westminster coroner, Dr. Gavin Thurston, decided that with or without Lucan, he could wait no longer to conduct an inquest into the death of Sandra Rivet. The proceedings opened on the morning of Monday, June the 16th. Lady Lucan would be one of the principal witnesses. But while Lady Lucan and the police were represented by counsel, no one was permitted to represent Lord Lucan. Michael Eastham QC, representing Lucan's mother, did the best he could, but such were the prejudices of the coroner against Lucan that his case went entirely by default. Lucan had already been tried by the press, but nobody had expected him to be tried also by Dr. Gavin Thurston. The police case began with evidence of Lucan borrowing the Ford car of his friend Michael Stoop two weeks before the murder, although he had a perfectly good Mercedes of his own. We were playing bridge, I think. Um, and he came up to me and, and said, could he borrow my car? And uh, I then had two cars at that time, one quite nice one and one dreadful one. And I said he could borrow the, the nicer one. And he said, no, he wanted the Ford Corsair. The reason the police suggested was that if he wanted to dispose of a body, it was not a car that anyone would associate him with. Then, during the weekend before the murder, Lucan asked his daughter, Frances, what the police considered a very significant question. Mummy says she has boyfriends. When did she go out with them? On her days off. <laughs> Which days are those? Thursdays. This, say the police, was to discover when his wife would be alone in the house with the children. But did he also ask Frances, one wonders, if her mother went routinely to the basement every night to make tea, and if so, at what time? Then, on the night of the murder, Lucan called briefly at the Claremont Club. Billy Edgson was on duty. Well, I came on duty about eight o'clock, and I was standing outside the door of the Claremont Club, and Lord Lucan appeared in his car. Billy! Any of my chums in yet? No, my lord. Righto, thank you. And then he drove off. I would say that would be about quarter to nine. Well, I would say that that's part of his alibi. That it wasn't a normal thing for him to go to the Claremont Club, as he did on that night, and to ask whether his friends had arrived. But he did on this occasion. The police think Lucan went straight from the Claremont Club to Lower Belgrave Street let himself in, went to the basement to wait for his wife, removed the light bulb, and in the dark and by mistake, killed Sandra Rivet instead. Having committed the murder, her body was put into the sack. Now, when we talk about a sack, it was a, a mailbag, and a very big mailbag with a big opening at the top, not just like an opening of a kit bag, and he's a big man, and she had a tiny woman. And presumably she was folded up, put into the sack, and then Lucan walked up the basement stairs, and he went into a little cloak room there, and then he did wash his hands because blood and hair was later found in the wash basin. And then he heard his wife saying, Sandra, Sandra. After a time, I went down to the ground floor to see what had happened to the tea. Sandra had been gone some time. When I looked downstairs to the basement, I saw there was no light. I called out to Sandra and heard a noise from somebody or something in the downstairs cloakroom. As I walked towards the sound, 
Somebody rushed out and hit me on the head. Did you hear anybody speak at that time? At the time I was hit on the head, no. Later, I did. I screamed. What happened then? The person said, shut up. Did you recognize the voice? Yes. It was my husband. Lady Lucan then allowed the husband she claimed had attacked her to take her up to her bedroom. Francis, who was still watching television, was sent to bed. There now occurs one of the strangest interludes in this strangest of all murder cases. For the next 40 minutes, the Lucans remained in her bedroom. What they did or talked about, if anything, is a mystery. Veronica told the police she intended to leave the house as soon as she had an opportunity. Still bleeding from her wounds, she made her way unsteadily along the street to the safety of the plumber's arms. Veronica? Veronica? Soon after, Lucan also left. He set off for the house of his friend Ian Maxwell Scott, 45 miles away at Uckfield in Sussex. Ian had decided to stay in London for the night, but his wife Susan was at home. She'd gone to bed when she heard the doorbell ring. My thought uh, at the time when I saw him, because I certainly it was most unexpected to see him suddenly appearing late at night, for I hadn't seen him for years down at my house, and my thought, just shows how selfish I am, was that Ian perhaps had decided to drive and had an accident, because it would be just like John to, instead of telephoning me and telling me, to have come all the way down to break the news in person. So I went down feeling rather frightened. John. Susie, is Ian in? No, I'm afraid he's in London tonight. Oh. John, come in anyway, I'll get you a drink. Thank you. Susan Maxwell Scott was the only person to hear directly from Lucan his version of what happened that night. He said, I was walking past the house on my way to change for dinner. What happened? And I saw a struggle in the basement. It appeared to be someone attacking Veronica. So he let himself in at the front door with his own key. And as he got uh, the basement stairs, he slipped into a pool of blood. And by the time he got up, the man who had been attacking Veronica had, according to him, gone off. So I said, well, where? I said, well, in the back somewhere. And I said, did you see him? And, I mean, enough to recognize him again. And John said, um, no, I mean, he was large. That was all he could say. She then said to him that he's murdered the nanny and pointed to a sack, which John assumed that the body was there, though he never, ever went to look to verify that. And then Veronica said, you hired him to murder me. Then Lucan asked if he could make a call to his mother. Do you want to speak to them? No, no, I... I won't speak to them now. I'll phone them in the morning. Good night, John. Before leaving, Lucan wrote two letters to his brother-in-law, Bill Shan Kidd. One concerned his finances, 
The other was more personal. Dear Bill, the most ghastly circumstances arose for my... I took her upstairs and sent Frances to bed and tried to clean her up. She lay doggo for a bit and when I was in the bathroom left the house. The circumstantial evidence against me is strong in that V will say it was all my doing. I also will lie doggo for a bit. But I am only concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. V has demonstrated her hatred for me in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Yours ever, John. He left the two letters on a tray. Susan Maxwell Scott gave them to her daughter to post next morning. When Bill received them the day after, he took them at once to the police. Both the letters had blood on the backs of the envelopes, as though somebody had sealed them down and ran the back of their hand over the envelopes and smearing blood. And at number 46, there was blood everywhere. On the walls of the basement staircase, in footprints leading towards the back garden, on leaves in the garden itself, and on a length of bandage lead piping found in the hall and believed to be the weapon used to bludgeon first Sandra and then Lady Lucan. The police dismissed Lucan's story about seeing a man fighting with his wife in the basement because they said he could not have seen through the Venetian blinds. They considered it a case of mistaken identity. Veronica Lucan was his intended victim, but he had killed the nanny instead. And then, out of the blue, and seven months after the murder, came an astonishing piece of evidence that the police had not revealed before. It came from the boot of the abandoned car at New Haven. I opened the boot up, and I was most surprised when I found in the boot a length of lead piping, bigger than the, uh, what we assume was the murder weapon, and bound up in the same way with the thick plaster. The first thing that I knew about what was in the boot was when a photograph was uh, flashed at me, I think at the, um, at the inquest. And uh, I was asked whether everything in this uh, boot belonged to me. It was a pretty big boot. Uh, I did notice, first of all, John's hat. And so I said, no, that's, that's not mine. And so they said, is everything else? And I said, probably because my, my car was always in a terrible mess. And then they said, what about that piece of lead piping? And I looked again, and, and I, there I saw a piece of lead piping, which of course was nothing to do with me, which had tape wrapped around it. When we heard about the lead piping being found in the boot of the car which was abandoned at New Haven, we were totally shocked, because it seems such an utterly damning piece of, of evidence. Unsurprisingly, the jury thought so too. Have you reached your verdict? Yes. Murder by Lord Lucan. The story about the inquest can really be summed up by my word, shocking. The uh, coroner was plainly biased. He was acting as if he were the sole judge. He tried to inveigle the jury to his view and got it. Lord Dukan had no legal representation of any kind. He wasn't present himself. He had no witnesses to call. It was... Uh, I know phrases come lightly to the lips, uh, they certainly don't to my. A travesty of so-called justice. We did feel that, that the coroner, Dr Gavin Thurston, was totally sympathetic to my sister-in-law and um, had made up his mind about the case and was determined to block all evidence to it, to contrary to what he thought had happened. 
and indeed uh, got the result that he wanted by the jury naming my brother. Well, I thought it was absolutely monstrous. We were not allowed to say anything. We could, we could only answer in uh, yes or no, I think, and some of the questions, you, was, you know, like, when have you stopped beating your wife? Or, uh, you, can't, you, you, you can't answer things yes or no. It's a farce, really, isn't it? It's a farce, coroner's call. I'm going to go very boldly on the record first. And that's to say that I am reasonably confident that if he were put on trial, he would be acquitted. As a lawyer, Sir James knew that an acquittal for Lucan would not have meant that he was innocent, simply that there had not been enough evidence to convict him. And what was the evidence against Lucan for the murder of Sandra Rivet? There was no forensic evidence at all. No evidence from any living person either. Simply an assumption that because of Veronica's claim that he had attacked her, he must also have attacked the nanny. But a case could have been made out for him, and had he been allowed to, Michael Easton would have made it, that Lucan was in the house to rescue Veronica from the man who had killed the nanny and was now attacking her. So, let's take a look at the police case against Lucan and consider some of the cracks in it. First, it was not a coincidence that Lucan was walking past the house when a man was attacking his wife, as his friend John Wilbraham remembers. I'd been staying with him for three or four nights just before uh, the murder, and um, we frequently used to walk past the house, either going to dinner or just in order to have a breath of fresh air. And he used to just look up at the window, see the lights were on, and reassure himself that all was well. The police also thought it significant that he had asked Francis when was the nanny's day off. In fact, his obsession about his children was such that he used to check on the movements of every nanny his wife employed, sometimes following them from the house. He did take a general and a particular interest because he wanted to know what these people were up to who were looking after his children. And the children see far more of the nanny than they do the parents, usually, in that kind of situation. and the matter of the motor cars. Lucan used to spy regularly on number 46 in his Mercedes. A couple of weeks before the murder, Veronica noticed him, as she told the police. I last saw my husband on October the 24th. He was sitting in his car, and I noticed he was wearing dark glasses. This was outside number 46, and he was about to drive away. The car was his dark blue Mercedes Benz, a car I knew quite well. She would be less likely to notice him in Michael Stoop's Ford Corsair. As he mentioned to several of his friends, that was why he had borrowed it. Furthermore, the various people who met Lucan in the days leading up to the murder saw no change in his demeanor or behavior. Indeed, on the very evening of the murder, Lucan saw his friend, Michael Hicks Beach. He phoned me and said that he'd been invited to give a lecture in Oxford on gambling and that he drafted the sort of thing that he wanted to say and would I come round and sort of correct it and make some suggestions and I said yeah sure so I got there about oh, I don't know six o'clock and he was very jovial but he didn't strike me as somebody who was just about to go off and um, batter his nanny or his wife to death he wasn't a natural public speaker at all, so he was a little worried about it, which is why he'd asked me to come along and just put the words right. Later, Lucan drove Hicks Beach home. Oh, is that all right, yeah. This leads to another problem with the police case, that of timing. The next sighting of Lucan that night was by Billy Edgson at the Clermont Club at about quarter to nine. Billy. From there, the police assumed that he went straight back to number 46 to carry out the murder. Well, we went, I went with the police to do some experiments to find how long it would take to get from Barclay Square to Lower Belgrave Street. So we did it about eight or nine times, and the average time was about ten minutes. The police believe Lucan left the Claremont Club and drove straight to Lower Belgrave Street, a journey they acknowledge takes between seven and twelve minutes to commit the murder. He would have had to drop the car, let himself in stealthily to the house, go down to the basement unseen, remove the light bulb, 
and settle himself before Veronica came down to make tea at nine o'clock. But Sandra, instead of Veronica, had gone downstairs that night, and that was at five to nine, according to Veronica's evidence. For Lucan to have been down in the basement at that time is extremely unlikely, if not impossible. After tea. But if the evidence of Francis is considered, the scenario becomes totally impossible. She impressed the police with her detailed recollections of the night, and, unlike Veronica, was very specific about timings, because, like many children, she knew the time according to what was showing on television. She said Sandra went down to the basement much earlier than her mother did. I went down and joined them. When the program finished at 8.30, I went back upstairs to the nursery and played a little more with my game. I stayed in the nursery for about five minutes. Then I went downstairs again to Mummy's room. That would have been about 8.40. Mummy, where's Sandra? Shh, she's gone to make some tea. Um, I... I'm not sure if Francis could have been mistaken about the time or even Lady Lucan mistaken about the time. Um, what I am convinced about, that is, the rest of the statement, the facts of the statement, uh, gi as given by Lady Francis, are correct. If Veronica is correct, it would have been nearly impossible for Lucan to have been in the basement at the time of the murder. And if Francis is correct, he would have been on his way to the Clermont Club when Sandra was killed. If, and I say if, he had had any thoughts of doing anything of this sort, he would have made quite sure, A, that the children were nowhere near, and that he was the other side of the world. He was not stupid. And he would realise that if any attack were made on Veronica, he would be the first suspect, obviously, because they always go for the husband. Um, and so it, it, the whole thing seemed totally preposterous to us. And how could Lucan be sure that Veronica would be coming down to make tea at that particular time? It was a routine she had only adopted since their separation. And how was it possible for him to have mistaken the nanny and her footsteps for the woman he had been married to for the past 11 years? I think it's hard to consider that you could mistake somebody else for your wife, um, even in the dark. Know, you know the feel, the smell of people, don't you? To put it at its most basic. And he would certainly have known the difference between Sandra, who was quite plump, I think, and Veronica, who was very slim. This was also the view of a crime historian who has made it his business to reinvestigate past cases. The Lucan case is absolutely fascinating and unique because it is the only case in which assuming Lord Lucan did it himself, a husband has set out to murder his wife by battering her to death and has battered the wrong person. If you think of battering, you're close to a person. You must have a sense of who they are. You must have a sense of the voice that you're hearing. And for a husband to get his wife wrong when battering her, a pretty unlikely story. The police say the mistake happened because the house was in darkness, but they have no evidence of it. How did they know when the basement bulb was taken out? Don't know. Except that Veronica Lucan said she didn't take it out. We couldn't ask Sandra of it, she was dead. And Lord Lucan wasn't there to ask in any case. Could the bulb have been taken out after the murder of Sandra Rivet, but before Veronica came down to the basement? Yes. But one bit of forensic evidence seems indisputable. Whoever murdered Sandra Rivet and put her body in the mailbag would have been saturated in blood. Yet when Francis saw her father when he took Veronica upstairs, she saw no blood on him. Nor did the last person known to have seen Lucan that night. Had he um, murdered Sandra Rivet and put her body in the sack, I agree with the police, he would have been covered in blood. He did not murder, he did not put her in the sack, and he certainly was not covered in blood. There was no sign of blood at all. Forensic experts even examined the seat on which Lucan had sat when talking to Susan Maxwell Scott and when writing his letters. That seat was examined by a forensic officer 
from Sussex Constabulary, but no blood was found. Which it almost certainly would have been if Lucan had murdered Sandra Rivet, but they found no forensic evidence at all. The letters written at Susan Maxwell Scott's are, however, revealing. Lucan's real concern appears not to be that he would be accused of Sandra's murder, but that he would be accused by his wife of the attack on her. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. And what were the police's views on these letters? They don't seem to be the ramblings of a man who's just committed a murder. And you can look upon that in two ways. One, he didn't commit the murder, but I say that the police are satisfied he did. And then the other thing that you must think about is that did he speak to somebody who dictated those letters for him to write? The abandoned car at New Haven was no help to the police either. The car was found abandoned at New Haven. I didn't say Lucan took it to New Haven. So who do you think might have left the lead pipe in the car? Well, I know who left it in the, in the boot of the car. That was Lucan. But what I said was, I don't know who put the car at New Haven. I don't know whether it was Lucan or whether it was somebody else. Do you have any doubts that it might have been Lucan? Yes. If the police think the car was left in New Haven by someone else, they have no evidence for it, or for the lead piping found in the boot. And at the inquest, the forensic expert would say no more than if the piping from the boot and the one believed to be the murder weapon did come from the same length, then they were never connected. In any case, if Lucan was the murderer, why would he leave an incriminating object in the car before abandoning it? Would not any man, much less an intelligent man like Lord Lucan, get rid of the piping, throw it over a hedge, throw it into a river. Can you think of a guilty man who would carry around with him in his car and leave behind him a part or possible part of the weapon? If the coroner had not disallowed the arguments of the Lucan family QC at the inquest, the gaping holes in the police case would surely have been discovered. In the end, the only evidence against him was entirely circumstantial, that of his wife claiming he had attacked her. But even that is now suspect. There's been a lot in the press from her, and I don't know whether, perhaps, looking back, she's remembered different things, but certainly the story does seem to have changed. Not quite week by week, but certainly month by month or year by year, we've read different things, and I don't know what she finally believes herself now. Over the years, Veronica has given varying accounts of what happened that night and of the times they happened. For instance, in a story she sold to the News of the World in 1981, she admitted it might not have been her husband who attacked her. I only know that at the time I thought my husband had hit me. I didn't think I had fallen, and maybe I did. Maybe he had lifted me to my feet when I recovered consciousness. There could quite easily have been someone hiding downstairs or in the cloakroom. I heard the taps. Well, I think Veronica may well have believed everything that she said at any given moment, but it's still possible that she was mistaken. After all, she suffered extensive in injuries and it could have been that coming round from those injuries, blows to the head, she could have been mistaken. Veronica's experience that night at whoever's hand must have been horrific, and its after effect stayed with her a long time. This is what she said in 1980. It might have been better for our family had he succeeded in killing me, and provided it, it didn't hurt, which I gather, uh, Sandra Rivet was killed with one blow, so she didn't actually feel anything. I wouldn't know, and if it were better for our family that this should have happened, then uh, I sometimes think uh, 
I wouldn't know anything about it. And our family would have continued without all this publicity and... You saying that you would have been prepared to sacrifice your life for the reputation of the Lucan family? Oh, certainly. Why? Well, uh, I don't have a very high opinion of the value of human life. I've lived quite a long time, anyway. Um, I've fulfilled my um, biological function. I've produced my children, um, or our children. Uh, and if it were better for all of them that I should have been killed, that's four people against one, then I think uh, there is a case for thinking that that might have been better. One thing is certain. Had Veronica told the coroner's inquest what she subsequently is said to have told the news of the world, it is inconceivable that the jury would have come to the verdict they did. Even as it stood, the verdict was seen to be so contrary to natural justice that the law was later changed to forbid any inquest jury from naming a person as responsible for murder. In Scotland, where they do not have inquests, Lord Lucan could never have been named. One further question about Lucan remains to be asked. If he did not murder Sandra Rivet, if there was nothing he felt he had to answer for, why did he disappear? I have known at least a half a dozen people who have disappeared for long periods in murder cases. About two of them have been traced, tried, one convicted and one acquitted. Why did they run away? Fear, worry, panic. Well, certainly, I think that his, his overriding reasons were to protect his children from the shame and stigma, stigma of him being in the dock for, as he put it, attempted murder. Notice he didn't say for murder. And he didn't realise at the time that there would be such a three-ring circus over these years, people looking for him and the publicity, which has probably been more damaging in the long run. If Lucan didn't murder the nanny, who did? There are two other possible scenarios which the police don't seem to have considered fully. The first is that Sandra was killed by a man she knew and had gone down to the basement to meet him. After all, she had never offered to make tea before, and why go down four flights to the basement when there was a kettle on the nursery floor just above? The other scenario is that Lucan hired a hitman to murder Veronica. This would explain why Sandra was killed in mistake for Veronica and why Lucan's clothes were not drenched in blood. And what happened to Lucan after that night? My own view is that he's dead. He was one of the most distinctive looking men I ever knew and I don't believe he had it in him to try and change himself. He was also very sociable, and I find Roy Ranson's idea of him swanning round the casinos of Botswana in disguise at the age of 60 quite ludicrous. I think he boarded the ferry to France, and after dark, being both bankrupt and an accessory to murder, slipped quietly over the side. What do others think? The last known person to see Lucan was Susan Maxwell Scott, who waved him off at around 1 a.m. on that fatal night in November 1974. What he intended to do, I have no idea, because I've told you all I know is what he said to me. He said he must go back and sort things out, and that he would let me know how it went. And I have no more idea than that. But there is a further clue to Lucan's whereabouts to be found in the last letter he wrote before disappearing to his friend Michael Stoop. My dear Michael, I have had a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidences. However, I won't bore you with anything or involve you except to say that when you come across my children, which I hope you will, please tell them that you knew me and that all I cared about was them. The fact that a crooked solicitor and a rotten psychiatrist destroyed me between them will be of no importance to the children. 
I gave Bill Shan Kidd my account of what actually happened. But judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe. And I no longer care, except that my children should be protected. Yours ever, John. I, I take it as being a, a, a very sad suicide note, really. My own conviction is that he um, got onto a ferry and got off it again in, in midstream and probably was caught up in the screws and uh, that's, the, that's that. I'm, I'm sure he committed suicide. My own, this is my own conviction. Uh, it's only a personal view, strictly a personal view, but I think he is alive. In uh, some remote corner of this wide, wide world. I think that he um, had found somewhere completely different to put the body, and I think he put himself there. I think it was only after the coroner's case, uh, when he was found guilty with no evidence for himself, no chance of speaking out, that that he may have felt that this is, I can't come back to this country um, for many, many years. So I, I like to think that he's still somewhere. I, I, I'm firmly of the opinion that he's alive. Um, I've always have been, and I've never changed that right from the start. As far as I'm concerned, my husband is still alive, and I have no reason to believe otherwise since his body has not been found. And um, when he disappeared, there was one of the greatest storms that there have ever been. And those several bodies were washed up. His was not. Do you think that uh, you would like to see him again one day, if you do believe he's alive? Um, as it appears that he doesn't want to be seen again, at any rate, so far, I don't want to see him again. And that's purely up to him. I mean, if he walks through the door, you would be glad to see him, despite exactly. all that's happened. Exactly. Yes, I would be glad to see him. Well, to start with, we thought he would reappear. And we waited for a telephone call or a letter or some kind of a signal that he was alive somewhere, or indeed that he might just walk in the door. And that didn't happen, didn't happen. We thought that he would come really because of the children. So we were forced to consider the possibility that he was dead. And uh, then we thought, well, there's difficulties in that because if you commit suicide, as had been suggested, um, then obviously it's very difficult to hide your own body, particularly when everybody's looking for you with high-tech equipment. The other possibility is, of course, that he was killed by somebody else. and. I don't know where that takes us to, but um, he hasn't reappeared. So we don't know any more than anybody else. We haven't any inside information on this. We just hope that he will turn up one day, that we, we will see him again and that he'll see his children. <laughs>